There are few moments in life that fill the heart with love and joy like a wedding. One's wedding day is a day of joy and happiness. Yes, tears will be shed, but not all tears are testimonies to the sorrows of life. Such an occasion exudes an atmosphere of love in all its many facets. A love like that of lifelong friends and that of passionate lovers. A love that is selflessly giving and a love that is divinely descriptive. It is also a symbol of hope. Hope for all the days of a long life to be shared between husband and wife. A wedding is all about the future. A groom vows to love and cherish from this day to the end of his life. The bride vows her undying love just the same. Each look into the future with all the expectation in the world, just knowing that they will enter the twilight of their days with one hand clasped firmly in the others. All of the witnesses to the nuptial come by with their hugs and handshakes. They give their warmest words of love and affection, of admiration and advice. In nearly every case, they wish them many happy future years together. The pastor himself, the servant of God that provided the ceremony, may even give words of instruction as to the guarding of their marriage so that they might enjoy many years together. But rare is the pastor who would tell the bride on her wedding day, quote, You have married a great man. Be sure to keep a death shroud close by because when you least expect it, your husband is going to be killed. Even rarer still is the bride who would look at her bridegroom and know it to be true. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. John Brown was born in Scotland in 1627. By the time he came into manhood, he was surrounded by a very volatile and violent religious world. A hundred years earlier, King Henry VIII decreed that England would break from the Catholic Church, forming what is called the Church of England. Simultaneously in Scotland, a religious reformation led by John Knox instigated the formation of the Church of Scotland. And there are varying degrees of difference between these two churches. The Church of England had a shadow of papal resemblance that did not sit well with the Church of Scotland. Also, the appointment of bishops and pastors was completely at the will of the monarchy and not the local church. But one significant disagreement between these two was over the head of the church. The Church of England decreed that the King of England was alone, quote, the only supreme head in earth of the church, end quote. The Presbyterian doctrine of the Church of Scotland would have none of this. They held that the head of the church is Jesus Christ and him alone. During the successive decades, regal pressure was placed on Scotland to accept the Church of England doctrine. In 1643, it became necessary for the Church of Scotland to outline their objections to conforming their religious practice. A document called the Solemn League and Covenant was drawn up. Scores of faithful Scottish Christians signed the document, many drawing blood from their own veins and using it as an ink to solemnize the act. These people became known as the Covenanters. The reaction of the throne of England to this descent was violence. The years roughly between 1679 and 1688 were known as the killing time. Covenanters were to be hunted, tortured, and executed in the thousands. Ministers were forced to flee for their lives into the hills and the countrysides. In the midst of these days, John Brown was a godly man that endeavored to eke out a life on a remote farm called Priest Hill in Kiley, Ashrire. Somewhere in his early life, he had come to Christ and had a deep desire to serve the Lord, even in the midst of such difficult times. He received an education not from a school, but from these wandering outcast ministers meeting in the hills and dells of seclusion. Although he wanted to be a preacher, he was hampered and personally discouraged by some sort of speech impediment. Yet this was an impediment he was freed from when he went into prayer with God. 
He was said to have the gift to pour out his soul in prayer with eloquent language and great fervency. He also spent some time teaching and training young people. With all the godly ministers killed and hiding under the threat of death, John, a simple layman, would gather young people from all around in his barn on Monday nights and teach them the Word of God. By the 1680s, John had already experienced much of the greatest joys and sorrows of life. John had taken a wife in the years prior, a wife that bare him, by some reports, a daughter named Janet and an infant son. But tragically, this first wife had passed away. History tells us nothing of this first wife or how she died. Death was very much a part of life in this time. It was not coldly hidden away in a hospital or tucked away in a funeral home. Life was fragile, and the threat of death by disease or tragedy was a daily reality. As soon as John recovered from the grief of the death of his first wife, he became acquainted with Isabel Weir from the parish of Sorn, not too far from Priest Hill. As far as personality goes, you could not ask for two more different people. John was reserved, grave, and somewhat painfully shy. While Isabel was lively and cheerful, she could light up a room just by entering it. They two instantly fell in love, spending time with each other as John conducted business with her father. The day finally came when John spoke to her concerning marriage. When he did so, he painted no rosy picture of what lay ahead for them if she should choose to marry him. He warned that one day he may be called upon to seal the church's testimony with his own blood. Isabel bravely said, quote, If it should be so, through affliction and death, I will be your comfort. The Lord has promised me grace, and he will give you glory. End quote. In 1682, exiled pastor and covenanter Alexander Padan performed the wedding ceremony of John Brown and Isabel Weir in a secret location. During the illegal ceremony, Padan said, quote, these witnesses of your vows have come at the risk of their own lives to hear God's word and his ordinance of marriage, end quote. After the vow was exchanged and the well-wishers were departing, Padan pulled the bride aside and said, quote, You've got a good husband. Value him highly. Keep linen for a winding sheet beside you. For in a day when you least expect it, thy master will be taken from thy head. In him, the image of our Lord and Savior is too visible to pass unnoticed by those who drive the chariot wheels of persecution through the breadth and length of bleeding Scotland. But fear not, thou shalt be comforted. End quote. Just three years later, this haunting prophecy would come to pass. John Graham of Claver House was a British soldier, a nobleman of some small degree. He was a junior lieutenant in the Scottish army under the command of the Duke of Monmouth. When he resigned his commission from the army, he returned to Scotland and was appointed captain by the King of England with orders to enforce the King's law which banned the gathering of covenanters and to scour the countryside and search for them. One of the many men he set his sights on was John Brown of Priest Hill. His reputation of piety and his unwillingness to conform to the religious demands of the king made him a target for Claver House. Early on the morning of May the 1st, 1685, John Brown arose to start the day of work on his farm. But not before he met with his God, singing the first four verses of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though the war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after him, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire into his temple. His Bible reading was from John chapter 16 and was a fitting verse for that morning. Its final words were verse 33 in which Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, 
that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John then bowed his head in prayer. It is said that this morning's prayer was one, quote, lost to the world and entered into the Holy of Holies through the rent veil of the Redeemer's death, end quote. Following that morning's worship, John went into the neighboring hills of his land to prepare some peat ground. It wasn't long before Claver House, with three troops of dragoons, surrounded him. They escorted him back home. As Brown bravely walked back to his house, Janet, his daughter, caught sight of a large number of horsemen being led by her father coming down the hill toward the house. She warned Isabel, who said, quote, The thing that I feared has come upon me. Give me grace for this hour, end quote. She quickly wrapped John's baby son in a blanket and went outside to meet the assembly of soldiers. Claver House ordered the search of their home where covenanter literature was found. Claver House asked John why he had not been to the state-sanctioned church and if he would swear the oath of abjuration. And this is an oath that affirmed the divine right of the king as the head of the church. John Brown, who was plagued with a stutter of speech, replied in the most clear and distinct voice that he only acknowledged Jesus Christ as the head of the church, that he would not attend the state church because they were just pawns of the king. And the only way he would obey and pray for the king is if he repented and turned from his wicked way. Upon his response, Claverhouse exploded in fury. Well then, go to your prayers, for you shall immediately die. John Brown of Priest Hill fell to his knees and began to call on God. He directed his prayers towards his wife, who was great with child, and the babe in her arms and the daughter at her side. He prayed, quote, that every covenanted blessing might be poured out upon her and her children, born and unborn, as one refreshed by the influence of the Holy Spirit when he comes down like rain upon the mown grass and showers upon the earth, end quote. Claverhouse sneered and blasphemed, interrupting his prayer twice. Finally, he had had enough. He demanded that Brown rise from his knees. John Brown said to his wife, quote, Isabel, this is the day I told you of before we were married. You see me summoned to appear in a few minutes before the court of heaven as a witness in our Redeemer's cause against the ruler of Scotland. Are you willing that I should part from you? No doubt through her sobs, she yielded in obedience to God and replied, quote, heartily willing, end quote. John threw his arms around his family, kissing them all goodbye. John then said, quote, that is all I wait for. Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Blessed be thou, O Holy Spirit, that speaketh more comfort to my heart than the voice of my oppressors can speak terror to my ears, end quote. Claverhouse ordered six of his dragoons to shoot at him. The men took aim, but the scene had so moved them to tears that they refused to fire. Claverhouse demanded that they shoot, and they still refused. Infuriated at their mutiny, Claverhouse dismounted his horse, pulled his pistol from his belt, pressed the barrel to the head of John, and pulled the trigger. A puff of blue smoke filled the air, along with the acrid smell of burnt gunpowder. The shot of the gun echoed off the heels of Priest Hill. Isabel and Janet screamed, and the baby cried. The bloody head of John Brown slumped over as his body crumpled to the ground. Claverhouse seized the moment to inflict as much pain on the grieving wife as he could. He asked, quote, what thinkest thou of thy fine husband now, woman? End quote. Fixing her tear-filled gaze on Claver House, she said, quote, I ever thought much good of him, and more good than ever now. End quote. With a 
flash of violence in his eyes, he replied, quote, It were but just to lay thee beside him, end quote. She replied, quote, If ye were permitted, I doubt not that your cruelty could go that length. But how will you answer for this morning's work, end quote? With an arrogant sneer, he said, To men, I can be answerable. And as for God, I will take him in my own hands, end quote. And with that, he dug his spurs into his horse and rode away with his men. The poet Henry Inglis describes the moment that followed. Tenderly, as on her marriage bed, the child on the moss she laid, and she stretched the cold limbs of the dead and drew the eyelids shade and bound the corpse's shattered head and shrouded the martyr in his plaid. And where the dead and living slept, sat in the wilderness and wept. The few gleaming years that John and Isabel spent together were no doubt years of joy and warmth. Like other couples, they stayed up late in the night dreaming of a long future together. But always in the back of their minds, unspoken to the ear of each, was an awareness that all which is held dear in this world is fading and temporal, and that the world beyond this life is the only one to truly prepare for. As sweet as marital love is in the fleeting days of this life, it cannot be compared to the joys of that heavenly land. John Brown of Priest Hill took to heart the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Forgotten is also available on various podcasting apps, such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Downcast. Be sure to stop into iTunes and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening.